Thank you, thank you. The reason that I created uh, this podcast is because I want to feel better. So many of the right-wing talk show hosts that I've listened to over the years make me feel worse, more anxious, more fearful, angrier. And I want to feel better, and I want the people who listen to my podcast to feel better after having listened to it than they did at the beginning. A lot of strange people out there. Yeah, strange people. I met a guy last week with a problem, though. Strange Ooh, guy? guy no, he told me he had an affair with a girl three months ago. He's going nuts. He didn't know what to do. He told me what happened was the rabbit didn't die. It just stays in critical condition. You know? <laughs> Well, you know, everybody has problems. In fact, I was talking to my brother the other day, you know. And I, well, actually, I said my brother, he's my half brother. Half brother. Yeah. Well, we have the same parents. He's just that way. You know? Oh, I see. <laughs> and it's wild having a brother who's gay, I'll tell you that. Really? And I always kid him. I tell him in the family tree, he's in the oh. section. You know? oh. No, nah, everybody has problems, Johnny. You kidding? My me too. My marriage is on the rocks again. Oh, you know. Oh, yeah. My wife broke up with her boyfriend. You know. <laughs> No, my marriage has always been shaky, always shaky. The day I got married, that was a beauty. Everybody was crying. Eh? During the ceremony, her mother cried. All the way to the hotel, my wife cried. She got undressed, I cried. I mean, everything. Was... Good morning. It's Wednesday, none braver Wednesday, March the 20th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the Serenity Prayer and the Patriotic Song of the Day, we will have Patriotic Shorts, Motivation, Bishop Barron, Ayn Rand, the 33 Strategies of War, and a selection from None Braver. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I should not change, the courage to change the things I should, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you, thank you, and now, cars. 
This car could easily ruin you. Even though this beautiful car is super cheap, run, don't walk away. Now let's see what we're driving today. Lots of wood, tons of buttons, heated seats, a nice screen, paddle shifters, a wooden steering wheel. I'm sitting in a Mercedes Benz and it's probably only worth three or four thousand dollars. And that's because it doesn't run great. Come on. Come on, baby. There it goes. Oh, just died. Let's give it another go. It's past service. It's got just about every warning light on the dash and it just doesn't want to stay running but that is only one of many problems it's kind of running kind of running come on baby you got to see this car from the outside because yeah visually it looks really good but doesn't it look super low well that's because the suspension has collapsed he's used a four corner air suspension um I, we actually own one of these cars it's about six thousand dollars to replace the suspension on this car and in perfect condition it might be worth seven grand this is the best cheap luxury car ever made. Let's see if you can figure out what I'm driving today. First of all, the seats are more comfortable than a Rolls Royce. The controls are on the door like a Mercedes, and they're heated. The dash is covered in fake wood. And wait till you see the back seat, because this is an extended wheelbase mini limousine in the back seat. Check out the legroom. It is just intense. And there's audio controls. You can move that seat with the switch and even a Kleenex holder, plus vanity mirrors and you can buy all this for just a few thousand dollars the lincoln town car is such an underrated luxury car especially the long wheelbase version these are super reliable they're powered by the same 4.6 liter v8 that you find in just about every cop car for decades this is one of the worst engines you can possibly buy and it's so bad it killed this car. The 2004 Land Rover Discovery 2 used a V8 engine that dates back to 1960. It was actually a Buick design, an all-aluminum design, and it was pretty advanced in 1960. But 44 years later, it had a lot of problems. Now, this engine overheated constantly, which took out head gaskets constantly. And when the head gaskets would fail, the steel cylinder liners inside of the aluminum block would start to slip and move up and down and take out the whole engine. In fact, it was so bad that Landover killed the Discovery name altogether in the U.S. because it was simply so unreliable. Friendly reminder, guys, if you own a Ford 5.4 liter three valve engine, do not put off a timing job. Once you're starting to hear that startup rattle, this is what's happening inside your engine. So that tensioner right there is bleeding out overnight. Your chain is sagging. And then it beats the heck out of that guide right there, especially in the right-hand side, until it literally beats it to death. And it will come apart. Chunks will go down into your pan, just like this. Fine metal. It'll all get down inside of there. And then it'll go to work on the front cover. You can see it's chewing here, 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 and especially right there. Look at that. Not to mention all those little pieces that are getting churned up inside of there are going down into the self of your pan. And look at that. It's plugging the heck out of your oil pickup. The lifeblood of your engine. Not good, guys. Don't put it off. Today I'm going to show you whether you need to use synthetic oil in your car or not. Now, full synthetic oil is an excellent oil, but it costs a lot more. Do you really need to spend the money? Now, in the case of my old Celica, it takes 10W30 oil. And in the past, I've always used normal Castro 10W30 oil and had no problems. But as you can see on this 2017 Toyota, it says to use 0W20 oil. And 0W oils are only available in full synthetic. So you got to buy synthetic oil. And don't think, oh, that's too thin. I'm going to put thicker oil in. These engines are designed for thinner oil. If you put a thicker oil, they will actually wear out faster. And that was cars. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now the uh, Patriotic Shorts. A buddy of mine that I went to high school with and all through the war with was transferred into the headquarters company, and he contacted me, didn't get any beer ration, could I help him? I said, sure, I'll call down the guardhouse. We got a lot of Japanese beer out back, so help yourself. That was the end of it, I thought. But then I got a call from our provo marshal that colonel had had them out for inspection on Saturday morning, and they all showed up a little inebriated. And he asked where they got this beer. I gave it to him. 
So I got court-martialed. <laughs> so I lost the stripes I had. Oh, no. But I said, as long as it doesn't hold me up from going home, uh, I don't care. So I went in the Army as a private and exited the Army as a private. He participated in over 20 battles during the Civil War, including First Bull Run, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. His name was James Hard, and when he passed away at the age of 111, he was the last Union combat veteran from the Civil War. Amazingly, a man who would live to see the atomic age also met President Lincoln on two occasions, the first coming at the White House shortly after the outbreak of the war. Well, son, you look like you would make a good soldier. Why don't you join up? Lincoln urged him on. So I did, and Lincoln gave me a handshake with a grip that nearly crushed my hand hard recalled about the encounter. The second meeting occurred at Bailey's Crossroads as Lincoln was inspecting the troops. He had a wonderful smile when he spoke to people. There was an aura about the man. Service to country ran in the family. James had an uncle who fought in the Revolutionary War and two great-grandsons that fought in World War II. I was proud to serve my country, he said shortly before passing away in 1953. It's the old story where they asked for 100 volunteers and they told that only two of you were coming back and there were 98 casualties. Well, you looked around to see who the other lucky fellow was, and you never dreamt that anything would happen to you. So when something happened to one of your buddies, it comes as a shock. You realize it's not like the movies. John McPhee, former Delta Force operator, amazing war fighter, a storied career at the unit. He was my boss. John was a force. He's one of those guys in garrison. He is not a fun human to work for. He's definitely not one that you want as your personal mentor about how to be a good human. But you put John McPhee in a case in glass that says break in case of war violence. And you break that. And he is one of the greatest war fighters to like walk during GWAT. We were a hammer in that first deployment. I'll bet. Zarqawi was the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq. He was infamous for posing with dead American soldiers, battlefield recovery of their weapons, dragging them through the streets. There were a few different special operations task forces that were tasked with eliminating support. All the while, we we're on this kill capture mission to find him specifically. The crescendo of that led to a single night where we had taken down targets week after week after week. I wasn't on target when he died, but when we get back, we're unloading, everything goes black. Everything gets cut for the whole entire compound. And that's when I was like, his last breaths as he was dying from shrapnel and overpressure was an American commando with his foot on his chest. When did you get the news? Almost the same time I heard that like, George Bush is going to fly in to shake everybody's hand. No sh <laughs> Nobody knew. He just hopped on a plane and flew over there to shake the hands of the men that killed the guy that had been doing so many unspeakable acts to so many. Why don't fighter jets use windshield wipers? This is an F-18 Hornet about to take off from an aircraft carrier. The canopy is full of rain, majorly reducing the pilot's visibility. But due to the acceleration and speed from the launch, all of this will be gone by the time the jet is in the air. However, this isn't the case for all jets. There's two other methods that act as windshield wipers in heavy rain, and almost nobody knows them. When it's desperately needed, bleed air or air from the engine's compressor section can be blasted into the front canopy by the pilot. It will clear rain, ice, and snow. Because it is dangerously hot and high pressure, it becomes so hot that leaving it on when not in use can break the canopy's glass. But for jets and military aircraft without this feature, there is another way. Water beading coatings will be applied to windscreens by the crew. The water is broken up into little beads by the coating. Even at slow speeds, this will do a decent job at making a good view for pilots, especially in heavy rain. When I picked up the flamethrower to eliminate some of the pillboxes, I was only doing that for which I was trained. Other Marines had trained me to do that. And had they not trained me, it would have been impossible. But by eliminating the seven pillboxes in the area in front of us, or at least eliminating the enemy within, according to what my commanding officer said, and I knew nothing about this, I'm a corporal, I don't, I don't know what's going on except in my own little realm. They said that by breaking through that string of pillboxes, it opened a lane that gave us an opportunity to continue to advance and succeed in our operation. As two F-14s approached the Al-Qaim superphosphate plant, 
Six Iraqi SAM batteries were waiting for them, their bristling missiles ready to be launched into the clear blue sky. Already an F-15 had been shot down by one of the batteries during an earlier attack, while a B-52 had attempted to bomb the site but missed due to high winds. That led the Navy to send up an A-6 intruder which launched a slam missile from beyond the battery's deadly range. The missile hit the target, but the Navy still had no idea what the extent of the damage was. That's when two F-14s were called upon to fly into the heart of the Iraqi SAMs to take photos. As they pushed it up to Mach 1.2, the F-14 suddenly spotted what they thought was a missile coming toward them, until one of them shouted, It's a harm! Facing the threat of a harm missile, the Iraqi defense system quickly shut down, allowing the F-14s to fly over the silent batteries and complete their mission. Then he gives me this, like, fucking dad talk. He's like, I need you to clear this minefield. I'm like, what do you mean clear a minefield? He's like, I need your team to mark a route so the battalion can push through it. I'm like, how the fuck do you want me to do that? I have nothing. And um, they were talking about using, like, the grappling hook. You shoot, like, the 22 cartridge out of your six, M16. I'm like, you want me to shoot a grappling hook at nighttime in bad guy's territory to scrape it? You think that's the best idea? My team's going to get fucking murdered. And so the next best option was, let's be as quiet as possible, and we'll just use a bag. So that's so what we did. I took my Eagle Day Pack, shoved water bottles and rocks in that motherfucker, where it was manageable, towed a fucking line to it, toss it out, and pull it back. Something saucy on top, the Modus 50 Cal or Mark 19 grenade launcher, and then you got a 240 mounted on the back, medium machine gun. Everyone else is just rolling thunder. Everybody's guns pointing out in sectors, and you're just pushing through. And we just drove all over looking to pick a fight. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Some of it. You think about terrorists, and I had this perception of the brave suicide bomber. Oh, these guys are ready to die for what they believe in. It's funny, the high value targets, they're the first guys to immediately roll over. And they wouldn't put up a fight. Guys would run off into the darkness, not knowing that we could see through our night vision. You'd grab them and they'd smell like crap and piss in fear, just evacuate all over themselves. These are terrorists even in their own country. I'm rolling through your area of operations and they just let you go. And then they spray AK and then they disappear in the crowd. Fight me, you cowards. Come on. And that was the Patriotic Shorts. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, a little bit of motivation. How do you deal with disrespect? Disrespect is a common challenge that we all face in life, and it can be very upsetting and frustrating. But what if we could learn from the ancient philosophy of Stoicism, which teaches us how to handle difficult situations with wisdom and grace? In this video, we will explore 10 practical Stoic principles that can help us cope with disrespect in a better way. As usual, I challenge you to be strong and stay with me till the end of the video. Let's begin. 1. Keep your calm. One of the core teachings of Stoicism is that we are not disturbed by what happens to us, but by how we think about what happens to us. As Epictetus said, people are disturbed not by things, but by the view they take off them. This means that disrespect is not inherently harmful or offensive. It is our interpretation and judgment of it that make us feel hurt or angry. When someone disrespects you, remember that their behavior is a result of their own thoughts, feelings and opinions, not a reflection of your true value or worth. This can help you keep your calm and not let their disrespect affect your emotional state. 2. Reflect on yourself. Another important aspect of Stoicism is the practice of self-reflection and self-examination. The Stoics believed that the quality of our thoughts determines the quality of our lives and that we should always strive to improve ourselves and our actions. As Marcus Aurelius said, the happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. When you face disrespect, it is essential to reflect on yourself and ask yourself questions like, is there any truth in what the person said or did? Did I do or say anything that provoked this situation? 
How can I respond in a way that is consistent with my values and virtues? By reflecting on yourself and the situation objectively, you can gain a better understanding of the event and your own role in it. Self-reflection is a stoic way of ensuring that your responses are based on rational judgment rather than impulsive reactions. It helps you learn from the situation and promotes personal growth and wisdom. 3. Learn to pause. Seneca once said, Whenever you are angry, be assured that it is not only a present evil, but that you have increased a habit. Stoics believe in the importance of self-control and rationality. They argue that impulsive reactions driven by intense emotions like anger or frustration often lead to poor decisions and unnecessary suffering. When faced with disrespect, the stoic approach encourages you to avoid reacting impulsively. Instead, take a moment to pause and collect your thoughts. This pause allows you to regain control over your emotions and gives you the opportunity to respond in a more measured and thoughtful manner. By resisting the impulse to react immediately, you can better align your response with stoic principles of wisdom and self-control. This approach often leads to more constructive and less emotionally charged interactions when faced with disrespect. Pausing is a key stoic strategy to maintain composure and make rational decisions when confronted with disrespect ultimately leading to more positive outcomes and personal growth. 4. Have empathy. Epictetus, another influential Stoic philosopher, says, Seek not the good in external things, seek it in yourselves. Stoics believe in the interconnectedness of humanity, and that understanding the motivations and emotions of others can lead to better interactions and personal growth. When someone shows disrespect, Stoicism suggests practicing empathy. Try to put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand their perspective. Empathy can help you see the situation from a different angle and realize that the person's disrespect may not be personal or intentional. It may be caused by their own insecurities, fears, or ignorance. Empathy can also help you feel compassion for the person and reduce your negative feelings towards them. By empathizing with the person who disrespected you, you can avoid taking their words or actions personally and respond in a more respectful and dignified manner. Empathy helps you to understand the person's perspective, feelings and motivations. Instead of getting angry or defensive, you can respond with kindness and respect. This way, you can avoid escalating the conflict and maintain your dignity. Empathy also reflects the stoic principles of wisdom, compassion, and self-improvement. It enables you to learn from challenging situations and grow as a person. By practicing empathy, you can cope with disrespect in a more positive and constructive way. Before I proceed, count yourself as an exception for making it this far into the video. Now that you have shown how strong you are, let's make it till the end of the video. 5. Concentrate on virtue. One of the main ideas of Stoicism is to develop virtues such as wisdom and courage. These are the qualities that help us live well and act rightly. Seneca, a famous Stoic philosopher, wrote that virtue is nothing else than right reason. This means that being virtuous is the same as being rational and consistent with the natural order of things. Stoics believe that virtue is the highest good in life and that everything else is indifferent. When we face disrespect from others, Stoicism teaches us to focus on virtue in our response. This does not mean that we should ignore or tolerate the disrespect but rather that we should respond in a way that reflects our stoic values and principles. By focusing on virtue, we can avoid being influenced by our emotions, maintain our dignity and integrity, and grow as a person. Stoicism challenges us to be the best version of ourselves, even in difficult situations. 6. Embrace acceptance. One of the key lessons of stoicism is to accept the things that are not in our control, such as the disrespect of others. 
Epictetus said, He is a wise man who does not grieve for the things which he has not, but rejoices for those which he has. This means that we should be grateful for what we have and not worry about what we lack. Stoicism also teaches us to distinguish between what is in our control and what is not, which is known as the Stoic dichotomy of control. We can only control our own thoughts, feelings and actions, but not the external events or the behavior of others. Therefore, when we face disrespect, we should not let it affect our inner peace. Instead, we should accept it as a part of life and focus on what we can do to improve ourselves and our situation. By accepting disrespect with stoicism, we can avoid unnecessary anger, frustration and resentment. We can also learn from the experience and grow as a person. This helps us to deal with disrespect in a rational and calm way. 7. Use humor. Sometimes a little laughter goes a long way. As the ancient philosopher Seneca said, you have mastered yourself when you know how to deal with what you should not take seriously. Stoicism teaches us to control our emotions and act rationally, but it also recognizes the value of humor in coping with challenging situations. Humor can help us keep our emotional balance and avoid getting too angry or annoyed when someone disrespects us. Instead of letting our emotions get the best of us, we can choose to respond with a witty remark or a playful joke. Of course, humor should not be used inappropriately or excessively, but it can be a useful stoic technique to handle disrespect in a way that creates a more positive and peaceful outcome. 8. Set clear boundaries. Stoicism is not about being a doormat. It's about being a rock. A rock that stands firm in the face of disrespect and injustice. A rock that knows its worth and demands respect from others. A rock that controls what it can and lets go of what it can't. When someone disrespects you, you don't have to take it lying down. You don't have to lash out in anger either. You can be calm and assertive. You can tell them what they did wrong and how you expect them to treat you. You can set clear and reasonable boundaries that protect your dignity and self-respect. This is what Stoicism teaches us. It teaches us to be strong, just, and courageous. It teaches us to respect ourselves and others. It teaches us to maintain our inner control and our outer dignity in any situation. 9. Choose forgiveness. Imagine someone disrespects you. How do you react? Do you lash out in anger or do you let it go? The ancient philosophy of Stoicism has some wisdom to offer. Stoics believe that forgiveness is not a favor to the other person, but a gift to yourself. Forgiveness is the key to inner peace and happiness, but forgiveness is not easy. It does not mean forgetting or approving what happened. It means choosing to release the negative emotions that are hurting you more than anyone else. Stoics say that we should forgive all, but not indiscriminately. We should forgive wisely, with compassion and justice. Stoicism teaches us to focus on what we can control and let go of what we can't. We can't control how others behave, but we can control how we respond. We can choose to forgive and free ourselves from the burden of anger and resentment. We can choose to move on with a sense of inner peace and tranquility. That's what stoicism means by forgiveness. It's not a weakness, but a strength. It's not a surrender, but a victory. It's not a sacrifice, but a reward. Forgiveness is the ultimate act of self-care and personal growth. 10. Change your perspective. Perspective is the ability to see things from a broader and more objective point of view. It helps you to avoid overreacting or taking things personally when someone disrespects you. Instead, it helps you to realize that disrespect is not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. As the Stoic Emperor Marcus Aurelius said, our life is what our thoughts make it. 
When you use perspective, you can see that most cases of disrespect are minor and temporary. They do not affect your true worth or happiness. You can also see that disrespect is often a reflection of the other person's ignorance, insecurity or weakness, not yours. You can choose to ignore it, forgive it or learn from it rather than letting it bother you. Perspective also helps you to focus on what really matters in life, your goals, values and virtues. You can use your energy and time to pursue what is good and meaningful for you, rather than wasting them on resentment or revenge. By doing so, you can live a more fulfilling and peaceful life. So, next time you face disrespect, remember to use perspective. It will help you to keep your cool and act wisely. Always remember that stoicism is not about suppressing your emotions, but managing them well. By applying these 10 principles, you can stay calm and strong when you face disrespect and rude behavior. Leave a thumbs up to help us reach more people in search of ancient wisdom. And that was a little motivation. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now the Daily Law for March 20th. March 20th. The Master's Brain. We can now say with confidence that the brain is an extraordinarily plastic biological system that is in a state of dynamic equilibrium with the external world. Even its basic connections are being constantly updated in response to changing sensory demands. B.S. Ramachandran. Something happens neurologically to the brain that is important for you to understand. When you start something new, a large number of neurons in the frontal cortex, the higher, more conscious command area of the brain, are recruited and become active, helping you in the learning process. The brain has to deal with a large amount of new information, and this would be stressful and overwhelming if only a limited part of the brain were used to handle it. The frontal cortex even expands in size in this initial phase as we focus hard on the task. But once something is repeated often enough, it becomes hardwired and automatic. And the neural pathways for this skill are delegated to other parts of the brain, farther down the cortex. Those neurons in the frontal cortex that we needed in the initial stages are now freed up to help in learning something else, and the area goes back to its normal size. In the end, an entire network of neurons is developed to remember this single task, which accounts for the fact that we can still ride a bicycle years after we first learned how to do so. If we were to take a look at the frontal cortex of those who have mastered something through repetition, it would be remarkably still and inactive as they perform the skill. All of their brain activity is occurring in areas that are lower down, and require much less conscious control. Daily Law The more skills you learn, the richer the landscape of the brain. It's up to you. Mastery Chapter 2 Submit to Reality, the Ideal Apprenticeship And that was the uh, Daily Law for March the 20th from the book The Daily Laws by Robert Greene. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Bishop Robert Barron. What do we see when we see Jesus nailed to the cross? We see our own sin. I know, I know. We're tempted because our culture teaches us this all the time. We're tempted to say, hey, I'm, I'm basically okay. You're basically okay. Don't let anyone tell you you got any problems. We're all basically fine. What do we see on that cross, therefore? We see all the forms of human resistance to Christ. Yes, cruelty, hatred, violence, stupidity, injustice, our own self-absorption, self-protection, running away, denying, betraying, all of that is made visible on the cross. Whenever we're tempted to say, I'm okay and you're okay, all we need to do is hold up the cross of Jesus and we see our own 
sin, we see as though in a spiritual mirror what is off with us. And see, friends, that is in itself healing. And that was Bishop Robert Barron. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the Ayn Rand thought of the day. Quote, The next time you hear about a crazed gang of juvenile delinquents, don't look for such explanations as slum childhood, economic underprivilege, or parental neglect. Look at the moral atmosphere of the country, at the examples set by their elders and by their public leaders. Unquote. And that was the Ayn Rand thought of the day. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now we uh, pick up where we left off with the 33 strategies of war. The anti-Roosevelt newspapers published a slew of editorials attacking him in personal terms. The chorus of criticism grew. And the Republicans watched gleefully, as many in Roosevelt's camp seemed to panic. One poll had Landon building a substantial lead. Not until late September, a mere six weeks before the election, did Roosevelt finally start his campaign. And then, to everyone's shock, he dropped the nonpartisan presidential air that he had worn so naturally. Positioning himself clearly to Landon's left, he drew a sharp contrast between the two candidates. He quoted with great sarcasm Landon's speeches supporting the New Deal, but claiming to be able to do it better. Why vote for a man with basically the same ideas and approach, but with no experience in making them work? As the days went by, Roosevelt's voice grew louder and clearer, his gestures more animated, his oratory even biblical in tone. He was David facing the Goliath of the big business interests that wanted to return the country to the era of monopolies and robber barons. The Republicans watched in horror as Roosevelt's crowds swelled. All those whom the New Deal had helped in any way showed up in the tens of thousands, and their response to Roosevelt was almost religious in its fervor. In one particularly rousing speech, Roosevelt cataloged the moneyed interests arrayed against him. Never before in our history, he concluded, have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. I should like to have it said of my second administration that in it these forces met their master. Landon, sensing the great change in the tide of the election, came out with sharper attacks and tried to distance himself from the New Deal, which he had earlier claimed to support, but all of this only seemed to dig him in a deeper hole. He had changed too late, and clearly in reaction to his waning fortunes. On election day, Roosevelt won by what at the time was the greatest popular margin in U.S. electoral history. He won all but two states— and the Republicans were reduced to 16 seats in the Senate. More amazing than the size of his unprecedented victory was the speed with which he had turned the tide. Interpretation As Roosevelt followed the Republican convention, he clearly saw the line they would take in the months to come, a centrist line, emphasizing values and character over policy. Now he could lay the perfect trap by abandoning the field. Over the weeks to come, Landon would pound his moderate position into the public's mind, committing himself to it further and further. Meanwhile, the more right-wing Republicans would attack the president in bitter, personal terms. Roosevelt knew that a time would come when Landon's poll numbers would peak. The public would have had its fill of his bland message and the right's vitriolic attacks. Sensing that moment in late September... He returned to the stage and positioned himself clearly to Landon's left. The choice was strategic, not ideological. It let him draw a sharp distinction between Landon and himself. In a time of crisis like the Depression, it was best to look resolute and strong 
to stand for something firm, to oppose a clear enemy. The attacks from the right gave him that clear enemy, while Landon's milk-toast posturing made him look strong by contrast. Either way, he won. Now Landon was presented with a dilemma. If he kept going with his centrist appeal, he would bore the public and seem weak. If he moved to the right, the choice he actually took, he would be inconsistent and look desperate. This was pure maneuver warfare. Begin by taking a position of strength, in Roosevelt's case, his initial presidential bipartisan pose, that leaves you with open options and room to maneuver. Then, let your enemies show their direction. Once they commit to a position, let them hold it. In fact, let them trumpet it. Now that they are fixed in place, maneuver to the side that will crowd them, leaving them only bad options. By waiting to make this maneuver until the last six weeks of the presidential race, Roosevelt both denied the Republicans any time to adjust and kept his own strident appeal from wearing thin. Everything is political in the world today, and politics is all about positioning. In any political battle, the best way to stake out a position is to draw a sharp contrast with the other side. If you have to resort to speeches to make this contrast, you are on shaky ground. People distrust words. Insisting that you are strong or well-qualified rings as self-promotion. Instead, make the opposing side talk and take the first move. Once they have committed to a position and fixed it in other people's minds, they are ripe for the sickle. Now you can create a contrast by quoting their words back at them, showing how different you are in tone, in attitude, in action. Make the contrast deep. If they commit to some radical position, do not respond by being moderate. Moderation is generally weak. Attack them for promoting instability, for being power-hungry revolutionaries. If they respond by toning down their appeal, nail them for being inconsistent. If they stay the course, their message will wear thin. If they become more strident in self-defense, you make your point about their instability. Use this strategy in the battles of daily life. Letting people commit themselves to a position you can turn into a dead end. Never say you are strong. Show you are. By making a contrast between yourself and your inconsistent or moderate opponents. And that was the 33 Strategies of War. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So uh, if you're a Democrat, you should be re voting Republican and become a Republican because the pressure's off. Uh, on the Democrat side of the, the ticket, the Democrats are under constant pressure to produce paradise and to produce it yesterday. The Democrat Party is about 50 years behind schedule. They should have created paradise about 50 years ago, but they failed to do so. So the pressure is on, the pressure is on, the pressure is on. Got to get the movement, got to get... Uh, Perfect, 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 perfect. And from the time you get up in the morning until the time you go to bed at night, you're under the gun. Your fellow Democrats are looking at you wondering why it is that you're going to Starbucks instead of doing something to create socialist paradise. But in the Republican Party, no such thing. Because we're realistic. We know there's never been a paradise. There isn't now. And therefore, there's not going to be any type of paradise other than the second coming of Jesus Christ. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Our educational system is failing because subversives have successfully claimed that history is written by the winners. This leaves the psychological impression that history is a matter of politics and not a matter of scholarship. And since all academic subjects have a history, they are now all under socio-political pressure. This makes our educational system unreliable and our children suffer as a result. 
Howard Zinn's People, People's History of the United States and Queer Strippers in Elementary Schools are two examples of the subversive's use of our educational system as a tool to further their aims to reestablish excellence in our educational system, we must reemphasize the scholarship involved in all subjects, but particularly in history. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now we uh, pick up where we left off with none braver. It's not that we're intentionally misfits. It's that we've got much more important things to think about, to worry about than whether or not your boots are bloused or your hat is on. It's like if somebody comes up to me and tells me, hey, where's your reflective belt? I'm thinking, all right, the war must be over here because you're worried about me having a reflective belt on. There's many more things you could worry about than me having a reflective belt on or something stupid like standing up in the back of the truck when you're driving to a brief or whatever. To me, my job is dangerous. Riding around in the back of a truck at 15 miles an hour is not dangerous. Even if I fell out at 15 miles an hour, it would be less dangerous than my job on a day-to-day basis. And then he sums it up with the essence of the situation. I don't really belong in the military, but I kind of fit in pararescue. I didn't know what we'd be doing when I was back as a civilian, obviously, but I, I read the little brochure and I watched a little clip, and I was thinking, ooh, mountain climbing. And in my mind's eye, I pictured a pilot in a foreign country hanging from his parachute by a root on the side of a mountain. That's what I was picturing. He's stuck, hanging on the side of the mountain. No way for him to do anything. And then what he sees is my hand reaching in and me saying, Hi, my name's Tara. I'm going to save your life now. Are you ready? That's what attracted me. Because that's the essence of good. It doesn't get any more real than one man to another man. I will save your life now. It's just an old idea of nobility. Yes, firefighters, also another very noble job. The stuff that little kids make into heroes. When I was going through the school, what we were supposed to carry with us is silent professional. Not the Navy SEAL image where you tell everybody that you're a Navy SEAL and then you prove it by getting into a bar fight. We're supposed to sneak in, do our thing, and go out. So we'll go into the burning building and then try not to get on the news about it but we're changing our image from silent professional to how come nobody knows who we are? The nobody knows who we are complaint has nothing to do with getting his picture in the paper for a spectacular rescue. What he's leading up to is a plug to expand the pararescue corps so that there's less burnout, fewer destroyed marriages, and more time for additional training. Until recently, the Air Force never mounted a recruiting effort for PJs. But Barrington and others say it desperately needs to be done. We need to get the word out, because this is my fifth month over here in this little dwelling. Got two more to go, and that's this year. I was home for about two months, half of which I was at Emergency Medical Service Advanced Training, which left a month at home between then and now, which is completely the way I like it. However, I would like more freedom to go to other schools. I don't just want to deploy. I'd like to go to Jumpmaster School. Dive master school, static line, free fall, structural collapse school, tactical lead climbing schools. It's endless the places you can go. Having more PJs would allow the flexibility and maybe save some marriages. The deployment schedule is hard on a lot of women and a lot of marriages. That might be the number one reason for the high divorce rate. Just the sheer fact that it's hard to be married to a guy who's gone most of the year, every year, year after year. It just finally falls apart. If we got more PJs, and I would say we need about double what we've got, we could allow the flexibility for married guys to just be asked, hey, would you like to go on these two deployments back to back? And they could say, well, I've got a baby coming. I'd like to spend some time with my family. Having more PJs would allow them to do that. Well, that's never going to happen. It's just my little pipe dream. The senior pararescue leadership agrees that they need to do a better job of recruiting. Chief Master Sergeant Bob Holler says, We just need to get more people in the front door because I don't want to change standards. I like who we are. Holler's implication is that the PJ school is not unhappy with the 85% washout rate at Indoc because they know that 99% of the candidates that Indoc feeds into the training pipeline will graduate. That's why he says the only way to fix their manpower shortage is to get more guys in the front door. 
The pararescue men are extraordinarily concerned about constantly upgrading their training, and guys like Barrington feel that the excessively heavy deployment schedule, whether or not there's a war on, is problematic. Medical skills need constant updating as new techniques and new equipment are integrated into their bag of tricks. And it's not the sort of thing that can be learned on the job. Take the complicated medical procedure known as insertion of an interosseous catheter that the PJs learned how to do by practicing on each other during advanced medical training classes. The procedure allows IV fluids to be given to, for example, a burn victim who doesn't have veins suitable for injection. It involves administering a local anesthetic, then using a device to punch a hole in mid-sternum, threading a tube into the bone marrow, locking it in place, and giving the IV injection directly into the bone. Doing it this way, they can give a liter of fluid in 30 seconds. In the training program, they had to perform it on their fellow trainees and, in turn, have it done to them. While preparing couscous on an electric burner in the Haas, Barrington is the unit's only vegan at the moment, and their kitchen is supplied with four different kinds of olive oil and enough seasonings and spices to provision a gourmet restaurant. Tara described another medical procedure the PJs are prepared to perform that has amazed visiting doctors. We can do pubic needle cystotomy. Maybe somebody stepped on a landmine, and the part of their body that they need to urinate is either blown off or severely damaged, where they can't pee voluntarily, and you can't catheterize them. You still need to drain their bladder, or it's going to become a very serious problem. So you just take a big, long needle, like you'd give us an IV, and you poke it right in above the pubic symphesis. Boom! Right in the bladder, because the bladder, when it's full, comes right up there. Poke it in, drain the bladder, then you can pull it out. Suddenly, they're your best friend, because they had to pee really, really, really bad. Instant success. That's something that a lot of these docs don't even do here. I don't know how many of them have training on it. There's a lot of things that we do in the field that has them asking, you do what? Now, how's that go? I can do minor surgeries like suturing, for instance. No problem, hands down, no problem. The problem for Tara and the other boys in the Haz is that while they're training to deal with medical problems that would cause an urban EMT in a fancy ambulance to just step on the gas a lot harder, they're not getting very many missions. They all salivate at Bill Sign's parachute jump to the minefield, which Barrington is quick to point out was a jump to an injured patient. The minefield is just a bonus. And that's the pararescue dilemma. We're waiting for somebody to have a really bad day. If we come away from this and that somebody didn't have that really bad day, I don't know, it's kind of mixed feelings. We didn't get to do what we do best. But then again, that guy's probably all the happier for it, so... That might be the only thing that keeps this from being a total disappointment. We got to do some minor stuff, like transloads, but there's nothing cool about that. Hey, you want some Skittles? Sure, all right. Thirsty? All right. I mean, the guy was sick with dengue fever, but what am I going to do? Give him some Skittles. He was happy for them. He hadn't had food in a couple of days. What Barrington and the others fail to acknowledge, or refuse to acknowledge, is that the environment in which they're doing these transload missions on lumbering HC-130 aircraft is a dangerous one. Even though some of the aircrew refer to themselves as the 71st EHMO instead of ERQS, Expeditionary Rescue Squadron, they know the most benign mission can turn ugly in less than a second. Senior Master Sergeant Bill Sign, who was instrumental in getting the Haz at JBAD built to pararescue specifications, can personally testify to that PJ fact of life. He didn't even need to be out on a mission for things to get ugly. The war on terrorism came to him. It happened six years earlier on June 25, 1996, in Saudi Arabia. He was leaving his room in the Kobar Tower apartments to work out in the gym when a huge terrorist bomb blew the front off the building at Dharan Air Force Base, killing 19 Americans and injuring 372, among them Sign. The bombers struck at 10 p.m., a time they chose by observing that most locals would have vacated the area adjacent to the huge apartment complex by then, and most of the American servicemen would be in their rooms. Their plan worked. Almost no locals were injured, minimizing any potential political backlash, and maximizing casualties among the U.S. troops stationed there. 
Sign had just stepped out the door of the room he shared with another PJ, Staff Sergeant Eric Castor, and was waiting to catch the elevator to the gym when he heard a muffled explosion. Then it was like I got tackled from behind. I could feel my hand sting when it hit the marble floor, and then it was all dark and you could hear glass tinkling and falling. He thought he never lost consciousness, but later pieced together the facts and realized he'd been knocked out. When he came to, he freed himself from the debris that covered him and began yelling to see if any other people were around. He knew something bad had happened to one arm and one leg because they hurt, but in the pitch dark of the bombed-out fourth-floor hallway, he couldn't see what was causing the pain. Sign was bleeding, but true to PJ form, decided that it was nothing like copious, so he didn't need to worry about it right away. His plan was to get out of the building, find the other PJs, and begin helping casualties, and he thought he was up to the task. Years later, he realizes that he was doing some things that were probably not normal. I got halfway down the stairs. They're all broken from the fourth floor. I thought I should be down at the ground level. I'd been traveling for a long time. And so I stopped and I yelled out, Can anyone hear me? Hey, am I on the ground floor or the basement? Of course, no one answers, and I'm thinking, I'm in the basement. I spent probably a year and a half in this place through the rotations, and I realized there's no basement in here. I just must not have gone far enough. Sign continued down until he could see a strange kind of yellow light from the outside. Pushing his way out the front door, he found a surreal scene with people on the ground screaming and PJs and medics already establishing a casualty collection point in the center of the compound. He walked up to a female medic whom he knew, working on one of the injured, and said, Hey, Rachel, what's up? That's when I knew I wasn't right. She looked at me kind of funny. I guess I didn't look too good. My arm was compressed and twisted, like the muscle hadn't popped back. Crunched. My calf was like that, too. They thought that both of them were broken, but they weren't. About this time, his head started to clear a bit, and he hooked up with another PJ, Staff Sergeant Mike Atkins. The two retrieved their med kits from the Humvees in the parking lot, and suddenly it hit sign that he hadn't seen his roommate, Eric Castor, who had been sitting at his computer in their room when the bomb went off. The two bloody PJs rushed back to the front door where a cop was guarding it. You can't go in there till the rescue people get here, he said. So we said, we are the rescue people. With their shrapnel wounds and dripping blood, they didn't look like it, but the guard lent them his flashlight and they picked their way up to the fourth floor. That's when Sign realized that the front of the building was gone. When you look into his room, just sky. He felt there was no way Eric could have survived the blast. But at that moment, three other PJs coming from the gym arrived and told him they'd seen him. Castor had suffered many injuries, none of them life-threatening. Later, when Sign spoke with Eric, he learned his friend had been sitting in their room, typing on the computer, and it just so happened he was doing something on email and he hit enter, just as the bomb went off. And of course, now he's flying through the air, a giant explosion, and for just a split second, he was like, okay, this practical joke stuff has gone too far. And that was uh, chapter five, part of chapter five, of None Braver by Michael Hirsch. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there and reminding you that you are not neutral and that the government has no rights. 